Welcome to Technovation. I'm your host, Peter High. My guest today is Daniela Roos. Daniela is a professor of electrical engineering and computer science and the director of the Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory at MIT. She's immersed in robotics, artificial intelligence, and data science, and her research is focused on enabling a future in which machines are pervasively integrated into the fabric of life and support people with cognitive and physical tasks. In this interview, we discuss some of the many examples in which robotics and AI have been used in new ways during the pandemic, why AI is most effective when people and machines work together, and some of the ways AI will positively impact our lives in the future. We also discuss why we should think of AI as though it were a series of interns and humans as the ones who make the important decisions, the state of autonomous vehicles, and the work Daniela's team is doing in that field, and a variety of other topics. If you enjoy Technovation, please consider reading my new book, Getting to Nimble, which provides lessons from leading tech execs on how best to modernize practices associated with people, processes, technology, ecosystems, and strategy to foster nimbleness. Order now on Amazon or visit gettingtonimble.com to learn more. Thank you. Daniela, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Well, I, you're an expert in um, in robotics, and I wanted to just take a quick moment, uh, among other areas, and I wanted to take a quick moment and, and um, ask you, what have been some of the most creative applications of, of robots during this time of pandemic? Uh, well, Peter, if you think about it, robots don't need masks. They don't get sick. They can be disinfected. Uh, they work around the clock. They don't complain. So they are very promising pandemic workers. Um, now, we have seen a lot of extraordinary efforts to bring what we have developed um, in the lab um, to the world. And a lot of these efforts uh, were done uh, genuinely, uh, out of a genuine desire to help um, the world. Um, so, for instance, uh, when the pandemic started in March and there was um, a shortage of ventilators, uh, our MIT team produced a ventilator, uh, well, or a robotic mechanism that could, uh, that could convert an ambu bag. An ambu bag is a manual ventilator, which is broadly available and inexpensive. So we have a method to convert an ambu bag into an automated ventilation system. And this could be done at low cost um, immediately um, using simple parts. Uh, we've published everything open source. I was so impressed by how passionate our students were uh, they worked around the clock because they felt that they could help their country, their city, the, the world um, with this technology. So that's one example that we did at MIT. But other examples include using robots uh, to monitor the patient's vital signs using Wi-Fi um, signals. Um, this allows the, uh, uh, the nurses to um, watch the patients from the distance and keeps the nurses safer. We have seen robots that connect patients to loved ones um, through uh, customized uh, telepresence um, and machines. Uh, we have seen robots that monitor public areas during lockdown. So for instance, Singapore deployed the Boston Dynamics uh, spot um, uh, robotic dog to make sure that people um, follow uh, the rules. Uh, we have seen UVC disinfection robots uh, that disinfected the aerosols and the services at food banks and hospitals. Uh, we have uh, swabbing and tissue collecting samples. These were uh, deployed in Denmark. We have seen drones that uh, connected medical facilities and delivered medical supplies. Uh, we have seen ground robots that delivered food. Um, we, have, uh, we have even seen robots in Japan that could roam through a zoo uh, to give people virtual tours and uh, live streaming of, of animals. Um, so we have seen so many extraordinary uh, new uses of, ro uh, of robots, all aimed at uh, keeping people safer and maybe um, supporting people uh, in, um, in times of need. And uh, this is really extraordinary. The community has been moved by the powerful images of the frontline healthcare workers uh, who showed up for patients, even at great risk to their own health. And the community felt that the one thing that we could do is um, to give them tools and technology that help them monitor, prevent, treat, and ultimately eradicate the disease. 
Incredible. Yeah. What, what, a, what a remarkable work the, the team is doing in partnership with others. I'd be interested as somebody who has been immersed in AI for so long, long before it, uh, even some of the people who've joined us began to use it in their own, their own uh, operations, at least as extensively as surely they are now. Um, can you talk a bit about the, the advances you're seeing on the AI side? Maybe the, the same kind of question uh, uh, that we just covered with regard to robotics, but now with an application towards artificial intelligence. What do you, think, what do you see as some of the most promising applications to the enterprise uh, coming forward right now? One of the technologies that has uh, advanced greatly um, in, the, in the recent months uh, has been uh, natural language processing, natural language understanding. Uh, through chatbots. Um, and um, so uh, we have, um, as a community, we have developed increasingly more powerful models. And in particular, the GPT-3 uh, is a new transformer. It's a new model uh, for natural language understanding. And this model has been trained on everything, every text you can imagine, all the books that are published, all the text information available on the internet. And the model is huge. It has uh, 175 billion parameters, that's a lot of parameters. Um, the, um, the training took $4.6 million in electricity cost, um, just, to, just to calibrate. And, um, but, um, but with this, this uh, super trained model, uh, we are enabling the kind of natural uh, question answering uh, that we have not had before. Uh, so the customer experience will indeed get better. One of the companies that adopted this technology is Lemonade. Uh, they IPO'd recently. And uh, I want to mention them because my students uh, have been promoting the company, telling me, hey, it only takes a half an hour uh, to get an insurance policy or to, to make a claim. And that is uh, extraordinary in terms of efficiencies. Um, now, there are so many ways in which AI is... Um, uh, is helping. In fact, the fact that we have vaccines and the vaccines were developed so fast uh, is due to advancements uh, in machine learning. Uh, we have had contact tracing automation uh, due to advancements in, uh, in AI. So we've had a lot of immediate applications to, um, uh, to, to pandemic related activities, but there is so much more uh, that uh, we can do with AI. And the most um, Exciting areas are around customization, are around using the new natural language systems. Um, altogether, it's important to keep in mind that um, these techniques are most effective when machines and people work together rather than machines by themselves and people by themselves because machines are good at some things and people are good at other things. When you put it all together, um, you, you get something much more powerful. And uh, the other thing that it's important to remember is that these AI systems are not, not so magical. They are not going to solve all of our problems and they're not going to take down the world. Uh, but they have, uh, they have some, um, some scope of, uh, of applications um, that, is, uh, that is extraordinary. So with these systems, uh, we can imagine a future uh, with no road fatalities. Uh, a future where we can transport people and goods much more effectively, where um, we can imagine a, a future of medicine where, where um, medication, where drugs are synthesized on demand to your body, to whatever your body needs, rather than using cocktails of, of existing drugs, and where we can better monitor, diagnose, and treat disease. Uh, we have a, already a future where we can communicate with each other instantly without necessarily understanding each other's um, world. I can speak to you in French and, uh, and have a system automatically translate what I say in English um, and the system would work pretty well. Basically, we can uh, imagine applications where machines take the routine tasks and people focus on, um, on strategic thinking, on critical thinking. But in doing so, uh, the, the human has to stay in charge because these systems make mistakes. So ultimately, it's good to think of AI systems as, as kind of interns uh, running around doing errands for you, presenting you with data um, that, uh, that you can act on. But ultimately, it's the human who really uh, needs to decide because we have not achieved the kind of performance um, that would make it safe for us to let um, 
um, these systems uh, make decision, especially not in safety critical applications. Yeah, that's very interesting. And you alluded momentarily there to uh, to autonomous driving and the, the 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 eventuality from your your lips to God's ears that we will re get to a point where there are no uh, road fatalities as a result of the advancements in that technology. I know you've been working on some of the thorniest issues related to that, allowing autonomous vehicles, for example, to drive in adverse uh, you know weather conditions or or other sorts of complexities. Talk a little bit about where we are uh, in, in the pathway to the eventual goal of full autonomous driving. Um, well, that's a very exciting uh, area, uh, Peter. I have been working on this for many years, um, 10 years on autonomous driving um, and uh, many more on mobility. And I would say that autonomous driving uh, is a very exciting challenge right now. We have made great strides as a community. But it's important to understand that today's solutions are also um, limited. Um, so today's solutions um, mostly apply to um, uh, geofenced areas. That means a closed area where every road has been pre-mapped um, and, um, and, uh, and these maps um, are high definition maps. So they're not Google maps. They're the kind of uh, maps that, um, uh, that are placed in sensor space. And they're huge. Um, for instance, uh, a map of San Francisco, high definition map of San Francisco takes on the order of terabytes of data. Whereas if you look at the topological map of all the roads uh, on the planet, that's only on the order of gigabytes. Um, so that you can kind of get a sense of what these solutions mean. And uh, there are limitations. So for instance, the sensors that are used right now for autonomous driving, laser scanners and cameras do not work in weather. And uh, that's why everyone is testing their vehicles in Arizona where it never rains and it never snows. Uh, so my group is interested in, in enabling autonomy in weather situations. My group is also interested in, um, uh, in extending the scope uh, beyond, uh, beyond geofenced areas where we have high definition maps to areas that have not been mapped before. Um, and, um, and, and what's important here is to, to realize that um, a map works well in a dense urban environment where there are lots of features. But if you go to the cornfields of Iowa or to the deserts of the Middle East, um, uh, those approaches will not work. So we need different methods. So we are looking at mapless uh, navigation. Uh, we're looking at, um, at uh, reducing the amount of um, time and the accuracy required of the perception system um, through new approaches to, um, to deciding what to, how to define what safe drivable regions are. And in a recent, uh, in a recent result uh, I'm, that I'm very excited about, uh, we're looking at how we can enable a future with mixed um, roadways where you have human driven cars and robot driven cars. And uh, that is really important because I, I believe that that's where we are going to be in the future. And right now, robot cars do not understand uh, human-driven cars. Um, so if a, if a human-driven uh, car is, is polite and wants to let you take that unprotected left-hand turn as a, as a robot, how, how do you know, how does the robot know that? How, how can the robot assess that the incoming traffic uh, is egotistic, may, uh, meaning, uh, the traffic is not going to slow down for the turn or uh, altruistic, meaning um, the, the vehicle will slow down. Uh, wow. And so we have a method that allows us to assess the personality of the cars on the road using a metric developed by the social behavior uh, community called social value orientation. And, and this metric is mathematical, so it can be mapped directly into the control system of a robot car. So I'm very excited about uh, the possibility of a future with human-driven cars that can coordinate well with robot-driven cars. But, and before we move to your next question, I do wanna say the following. So while, um, while we have all these limitations of the current technology and the current, um, the current uh, commercial solutions, I would say that we also have opportunity for great products. Uh, with what the technology can provide safely right now. And, but that is not uh, driving on the mass pike or through the crowded streets of Boston uh, at, uh, at rush time, okay? We can't do that. Um, we can't do weather, we can't do uh, heavy traffic, we can't do high speed traffic. Uh, what we can do safely, 
uh, a slow movement, where by slow, I mean safe speeds below 30 miles an hour in low complexity environments. So by that, I mean uh, campuses, retirement communities, definitely not uh, downtown Boston. Yeah. And so if we have, if we, uh, if we identify um, these particular applications, there is so much autonomous driving can do. Um, we, can have, um, we can have applications to, on factory yards and mm -hmm. ports and retirement communities and hospitals. We can, uh, we can make autonomous cars and golf carts and tuck trailers and wheelchairs and gurneys. Anything on wheels uh, can essentially be a product. And if that system is moving um, through spaces that are reasonably um, simple and at reasonably simple speeds, we have safety and we can deliver, deliver autonomy. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us today. It's been a great conversation with you. Thank you for having me, Peter. It's been an honor.